OHB, the prime contractor, and uh, all the industrial teams who've quite clearly proven that they've, they've built satellites that are robust and work. Oh, well, you're right, yes. And also, I must say that Ariane Espas and the Russian teams did also an excellent job to identify and deal with the malfunction mm -hmm. on, on Fregat. So they have restored full confidence in this uh, upper stage. And uh, I, they've gone even further because uh, they've used the experience to make some excellent improvements in their procedures also. So I think we've all learned a lot uh, out of it. Speed and altitude, we are 252 kilometers above our planet. Six and a half thousand, over six and a half thousand kilometers from our launch pad if we were to draw a line along the, the Earth. And we're flying at over eight kilometers per second. Galileo is going to provide some very exciting applications all over the world. Slowly but surely, the deployment phase of Galileo is underway. The European Space Agency, ESA, and the European Commission are building not only the satellite constellation, but also its associated ground segment. When the system is complete, it will consist of no less than 30 satellites and Galileo's exploitation phase can begin. However, future users of Galileo will not have to wait until the exploitation phase, as early services should be available once there is a sufficient number of satellites on orbit. The first thing that often comes to mind when speaking about Galileo or its American counterpart GPS is transportation and car guidance. But Galileo services will extend well beyond road navigation, and these services will be implemented on different levels. The most important one, of course, and the one that will be delivered first is the open service. This is for the open public, for the mass market. We will have also with Galileo other services of added value, like the commercial service, that will allow us to improve the accuracy and the reliability of the, of the signal. And this will be used for professional applications to obtain better accuracy on ground. These commercial services should have great impact on European traffic, as the transport sector will be given better tools to manage their fleets of lorries, coaches or even trains. Galileo services can optimize vehicle tracking, help avoiding congestion and hopefully reduce fuel consumption. Furthermore, Galileo will also assist in the field of agriculture, thanks to what is called precision farming. Guided tractor systems have been shown to reduce driver fatigue, allow for ultra-precise tillage, or more precise distribution of fertilizers and herbicides. As much the impact Galileo might have on land, it's hard to underestimate the effect it will have on other domains such as maritime transport. Not only will it contribute to safer and more precise navigation of more than 50,000 ships on our seas, but it will also enhance detection of distress beacons and notification of rescue services. And those features can also be implemented on land, for instance in places with difficult access, such as mountains where helicopter extraction might be the only hope for people in need. Another crucial field for navigation services is aviation. Today, Europe already augments GPS with the EGNOS system. It's done by giving air traffic an extra reference signal with higher accuracy and integrity. With this signal, aircraft can rely on space-based navigation, notably during landing procedures. Soon, EGNOS will rely on both GPS and Galileo signals, a redundancy that will provide confidence and safety. Today, it's already abundantly clear that the services rendered by the European navigation programs will benefit and impact our activities. This system and its applications will keep evolving according to users' needs and will surely become part of our daily life. Absolutely, and navigation is uh, becoming such an integral part of our, our lives. Who would have thought not very long ago nobody had navigation on their phones and now yeah, virtually everyone does. Um, let's turn our attention to this superb upper stage here, Frigate. It was originally designed by the Russians as an interplanetary probe and uh, it was then adapted to fly on Soyuz. Uh, yes, you are correct, because it can switch its engine uh, on and off uh, up to 20 times. Um, so it could take its passengers virtually anywhere they need to go. So that makes Soyuz ideal for launching constellations. And today we got two main boosts. And <clears throat> it's an important flight for Soyuz because it's its 50th launch today. 
Yes, it was it's first advantage. launched on 2000 from Baikonur. That's when it has uh, it was first adapted to fly on Soyuz. They, they had two qualifying flights that year, and then in the July it launched a cluster for the European Space Agency. Now, some folk here may well remember those four satellites. They uh, were bouncing around the magnetic field and telling us all about our magnetosphere, and they went off on two two uh, Soyuz flights in the, the July and eight, uh, August, and I remember because I was hosting the TV show, so that was memorable. We're coming up to the point where Frigate will switch off its engine. You can see there on the top right-hand side of the screen, if you look at the curve, we really are climbing into space now. Our altitude nearly seven, well, yep, 704 kilometers above the Earth. We're flying at over nine kilometers per second. That's pretty phenomenal. Frigate has cut off its engine, and we're in the ballistic phase. That means that means we're traveling without propulsion. Galileo is named after the Italian astronomer who discovered Jupiter's four largest moons, Galileo Galileo. Nowadays, all navigation systems depend on accurate timing. Oh, the time clock. Although from a distance the Galileo constellation may look like a molecule with electron satellites and the Earth as its core, this atomic comparison only really comes into its own when one considers what lies at the heart of Galileo, the measurement of time. In fact, the Galileo system is one vast space clock, the accuracy of which is crucial to the quality of position calculations and to ensure the success of this, Europe has developed what are known as atomic clocks. An atomic clock that deviates by one nanosecond produces an error on the ground of 30 centimeters, which, if translated to a second, makes an error of 300,000 kilometers, which means one might as well be on the moon. Hence the importance of reducing inaccuracy and the key role played by the clocks on board the Galileo satellites. Okay. The Galileo satellites are equipped with the best clock ever launched into space, known as the passive hydrogen maser, Okay. MESA stands for Microwave Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. Oh, geez, that's From the outside, the clock just looks like a large cylindrical case, but inside, atoms are dancing. Dancing a waltz with such regularity that it's in fact the source of this extreme precision. Uh -huh. okay. The functioning of the that atomic clock sense. is linked to the behavior and the movement of hydrogen as it follows a predetermined course. Oh. Hydrogen molecules are channeled into a space a where the fresh. molecules are split into two atoms that can be in two quantum states. States okay. that can be differentiated by their colors. These atoms then pass down a long tunnel where they're sorted before continuing towards a huge cavity where they move in every direction. Okay. This is where the atoms are stimulated, excited, causing them to pass from one state to another thus leading to the stimulated emission of microwave photons. Here, they're orange. The frequency of this emission is absolutely stable and reproducible, and it is this accuracy and regularity that produces the atomic rhythm, essential to the services offered by the Galileo system. These impulses are then transformed into signals which are sent to Earth with a metronomic rhythm. All the satellites that make up the Galileo constellation will be equipped with these clocks, whose unchanging rhythm will enable ground receivers to calculate with extreme accuracy user positions, time and speeds, data that is essential for a whole range of applications. phenomenal when you think how far we've come since Galileo realized that celestial bodies provided a clock in the sky back in the early 17th century. Nowadays our modern world is so dependent on accurate timing. I mean it would be disastrous if our navigation satellites were turned off. I absolutely yes. Uh, many things rely on accurate timing nowadays. Uh, for example power lines, telecommunication networks, uh, financial markets rely on real-time information systems 